Hello, everybody. So glad that you could join us for this event. Uh, we're happy to have you here to uh, hear reflections from Father David Neuhaus on the Holy Land, crisis in the Holy Land. I'm Gil Presby. I am the director of CLASA. That's the Kearney Latin American Solidarity Archive. And uh, we're the, the sponsors of this event. I want to thank our co-sponsors. We have the Office of Mission Integration. We have the Arthur J. McGovern Catholic Studies Program and the Department of Religious Studies and the Islamic Studies Program. The co-hosting with me here is Dr. Katie Merriman. She's director of the Islamic Studies Program here at our university. And there are co-sponsors as well as religious studies department. She's a religious studies faculty. So welcome, Katie. And could you please uh, tell folks about our Zoom webinar? Sure. So thank you so much, uh, Gail and uh, Father uh, Neuhaus for, for this incredible event. I'm here just to help as a facilitator. So we are now in a Zoom webinar. This is kind of mimicking a, a in-person event where we're kind of standing here on the stage uh, and then you all are sitting in the audience. So your ability to interact with us uh, is in the chat. Uh, so anytime during the talk, if you want, you can go to the chat feature and it's only going to go directly to us. It's not going to go to the rest of the audience. So um, at the end, um, after um, hearing uh, from uh, um, Father Neuhaus, um, we will go through the questions in the chat and then um, uh, Professor Presby will also um, call on people who are raising their hands, who want to use their voice uh, and their video to ask a question. So that will be happening after um, the lecture. So thank you so much for coming. Um, we're here to support you. And uh, I will turn it back to Professor Bresby to introduce our speaker. Um, hello. Um, thank you so much. I want to uh, welcome everyone. Uh, Father David Neuhaus, SJ, he's a member of the Jesuit community in the Holy Land. He is the Emeritus Latin Patriarchal Vicar for Hebrew-speaking Catholics, migrants, and asylum speakers, seekers in Israel. He has many scholarly publications, articles in America Magazine. At present, he resides and works in Jerusalem and in Johannesburg. Father Neuhaus completed a BA, MA, and PhD in political science at Hebrew University in Jerusalem. He then completed pontifical degrees in theology and scripture in Paris and Rome. He taught for many years at the seminary of the Latin Catholic Patriarchate in Bethlehem. I'm sure he'll tell you more about himself and his relevant experience in the course of this talk. At this point, Father Neuhaus, we all welcome you here. We are so grateful that you have agreed to join us like this across the miles. Thank you very, very much, Professor Presby, Pro Professor Merriman. I must add, not just across the miles, but across the time zones, <laughs> as I am at midnight and ready to go to bed, but I'll try not to do that before we finish tonight. I also apologize for the fact that I have a very bad cold, but hopefully my voice will hold out. In order to do this together, I am going to open a PowerPoint and we'll be discussing the PowerPoint for about 30, 35 minutes before we open up to your questions and hopefully we can have an interesting discussion. So let me try and do that now. Oops. Okay, I hope that you see what I see, which is 
the title of this presentation that was given to me by Professor Presby, or I think that we worked it out together, A Catholic Priest's Reflection on War in the Holy Land. And what I would like to do at the beginning, and again, this is at the request of Professor Presby, and I think it's always important, is to say perhaps a little more about who I am. For as we can well imagine, discussing the Holy Land, war in the Holy Land, is very, very sensitive, and people speak from very, very different perspectives. And I think it's only fair right at the beginning to give the perspective from which I'm speaking although perhaps you will realize that it's a rather complex perspective. So I'd like to start with that. So who is doing the reflecting when we talk about a Catholic priest reflecting on the war in the Holy Land? So as you already know, I am a Catholic priest. And of course, that conditions a certain, to a certain degree how I think. And not only am I a Catholic priest, but I'm a Jesuit Catholic priest which probably conditions me even more. Of course, very important to my identity is that I'm a Christian who has lived his Christian life for decades in the Holy Land. And I say Holy Land, of course, some would say Israel, some would say Palestine. I would tend to use the two names together, Israel-Palestine. But my perspective is perhaps made a little bit more complex than by the fact that I am not a Christian in my family origin. My parents are German Jews who ran away from Germany as Jews in the mid-1930s, and they found refuge in South Africa, where I was born in 1962. When I was 15 years old, because of the apartheid regime in South Africa, and my parents' fears that I would get involved too much in the struggle against apartheid, I was sent off just an adolescent to Jerusalem. And two years later, at the age of 17, I became an Israeli, of course, as a Jew. It was only later that I actually was baptized and formally joined the Catholic Church. But to add to the complexity, Arriving in Jerusalem with no family of my own, I was swallowed up into a wonderful second family. And my second family in Jerusalem is a family of Palestinian Muslims. Being Jewish and growing up in South Africa, educated within the Jewish school system, I arrived in Israel speaking Hebrew. And then being adopted into a Palestinian Muslim family, I started to become familiar with Arabic, later studying in the university and doing many years of classical Arabic, so that today I feel comfortable both in Hebrew and in Arabic. So this is the person who's reflecting. It doesn't mean that I know more than anyone else or understand things better than anyone else, but I think that everybody reflects from a certain vantage point, and this is the vantage point from which I am reflecting. So I think that anybody who reads the newspapers, watches television, follows social media, must know that there is a war going on in our part of the world. A war between Israelis and Palestinians, between Jews and Arabs. We'll come to that part in a moment. Who is fighting against, against whom? But I want to begin with a very complicated question, and that is, when did the war begin? I think many would want to give an answer that something very, very terrible happened on the 7th of October 2023 when Palestinian militants from the Gaza Strip came into the southern part of Israel and overran a number of small towns and villages on the border, killing a lot of people, maiming, raping, destroying an incredible surge in violence. Many Jews would say this is the worst attack, the worst attack of violence that Jews have known since the Second World War. And so many would say, well, the war began then. 
Until then, there seemed to have been some kind of calm, at least if you're a Jewish Israeli. And since the 7th of October, and it goes on even as we speak, the Gaza Strip, out of which these Palestinian uh, militants stormed, has been bombarded firstly by Israeli warplanes and then invaded by ground forces, leading up till now to the deaths of almost 30,000 people. And so we have incredible violence, incredible destruction. It is certainly a war. But I would argue, and this is very important to, in order to understand what is going on in the Holy Land today, that the war did not begin in 2023. It did not begin on October the 7th. The war goes back decades. And as you'll see, just looking at the list of dates I've put there, that I'm going to claim that this war was actually born in 1917. What are these dates that I've put here on the screen? I'm going to mention them as mileposts going backwards. So this is not the first time there has been violence between the Gaza Strip and Israel. In fact, until 2005, the Israelis controlled the Gaza Strip, and even then there was violence as Palestinians struggled against Israeli occupation and tried to throw it off in the name of liberation. But in 2005, the Israelis unilaterally withdrew from that small little piece of land. The Israelis have since argued that since they withdrew, why didn't the Palestinians build up their lives there and continue with normal living? Well, we need to understand that the Gaza Strip was only a very small part of territories that Israel had occupied in the war of 1967, many years before. In that war, which some people call the Six-Day War, but is preferably known as the 1967 war because many months of hostility led into the full-scale war, Israel occupied the Gaza Strip, which until then had been a part of Egypt, and occupied the West Bank, which had until then been annexed into the Kingdom of Jordan. These two pieces of land, the international community, has, for many decades, proposed should become a Palestinian state. For the Palestinians, even until now, are without real statehood, without sovereignty, without having the national authority to live their lives as a people. But even then, the war has a long history before 1967. <clears throat> In fact, the division of the Holy Land. I kicked me off the computer. Oh. Please, can you mute? So, the division of the Holy Land was the result of a United Nations decision in 1947. Already in 1947, there was a civil war going on in Palestine. The land was controlled by the British, and Jews and Arabs were struggling against one another for control of the land and against British uh, colonial rule. In 1947, the British went to the United Nations and said they could no longer rule the land. It was too much in violent uprising. And so on the 29th of November, 1947, the United Nations made a decision to divide the Holy Land into two parts, one part for the Jews and one part for the Palestinian Arabs, these two groups being involved in the struggle to control the land. In 1948, in May, the British withdrew and the State of Israel was declared. Immediately, a regional war began that only ended in January 1949 when the State of Israel was able to define its borders on 78% of the 
of historical Palestine. But the remaining 22% did not become a Palestinian state. A big part of that 22%, the West Bank, was annexed by the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. And the smaller part, the Gaza Strip, was included under Egyptian administration. This little strip and the entire West Bank was, were flooded with refugees, Palestinian Arabs, who either fled or were driven out of the territory of the State of Israel. Especially important is to note that in the Gaza Strip today, only 30% of the population is originally from Gaza. 70% of the Gaza Strip population are still refugees who hanker after the homes they left behind in 1947-1948. Even the fifth generation still remembers the villages from where they came, even the layout of the villages. But the problem <clears throat> did not even begin in 1947-1948. In fact, I would think that the war began in 1917. What happened in 1917 that changed the fate of Palestine, the Holy Land, what some now call Israel? In 1917, the British decided <coughs> that the Jews should have a homeland in Palestine. The Balfour Declaration was an undertaking of the British government to the Jewish community that the British would support massive Jewish immigration into Palestine and the creation of a state there for Jews. Why did they do that? What was the British motivation to support the establishment of a Jewish state in Palestine? And I would say that there are three very important motivating factors. These three factors remain very important in Western support for the state of Israel even until today. Factor number one, <clears throat> Jewish suffering. The Jews suffered for hundreds and hundreds of years, not always and not everywhere, but too often and in too many places, particularly in a world that was dominated by Christendom. Many Christians believed that the Jews had killed Jesus, that the Jews had refused to follow God's plan through Jesus Christ, and therefore they were an accursed people. This teaching of contempt for Jews led to very difficult circumstances and eventually in the 19th century was transformed into modern forms of Jew hatred that we know as anti-Semitism. And the British, particularly concerned with what was going on in the Russian Empire, where there were many, many Jews, felt that the Jews, like all other people, should have a homeland. Why in Palestine? Well, that's the second factor that played an important role, the Bible. Doesn't the Bible tell us that this was the land that God had given to the Jews? Of course, I would argue that that is a very, very wrong reading of the Bible in the 19th and 20th centuries. It smacks of what we might call fundamentalism. But the Bible played a very, very formative role in how the British formulated their support for the idea of a Jewish state in Palestine. And finally, a third factor that is also very important. The British and subsequent empires have seen the Jews as Europeans, equivalent in many ways to white colonial Europeans who would create a state at the heart of the Islamic world, at the heart of the Middle East, that would be a resource, a center for European civilizing influence in a region regarded as Islamic and barbaric. Here, of course, parallel to an anti-Semitism directed against Jews is what we know as Islamophobia directed against Muslims. 
So the war is rooted in European attitudes at a time when Europe was building empire. And what we see unfolding before our eyes today is rooted in attitudes that we might not hold anymore. But the fact is that hundreds of thousands of Jews moved to Palestine before the Second World War. And during the Second World War, when Hitler, in his genocidal hatred of Jews, tried to wipe Jews out, by the end of the war, many people were sympathetic to the Jews. Of course, the people who were overlooked were the Palestinians. Now, let's look at this a little more closely, the vocabulary that we are using. Who is who? So I would argue, and again, <clears throat> this is very much formulated within the context out of which I see things, that on this land, the Holy Land, there are two groups of people engaged in a struggle. But of course, it's very simplistic to say, say two groups. And we tend to confuse terminology when we talk about these two groups. So first of all, Palestinians. Generally, Palestinians are seen as the original inhabitants of the land. Interesting to note that in 1917, when the British arrived in Palestine, the Palestinians who lived in the land were made up of Muslims, a majority, Christians and Jews, Jews who already lived in the land and spoke Arabic and saw themselves as people of the land together with Muslims and Christians. Palestinians are a people within the much larger Arabic-speaking peoples of the Middle East, sharing language and often culture, and for Muslims, religion, with many of their co-religionists all through an Arabic-speaking Muslim Middle East. So again, the Palestinians, whose Particular circumstances are made more and more unique by the clash not only with European colonialism in the, force, in the form of the British, but also with increasing Jewish immigration, particularly from Europe, but not only. Their history becomes a very particular history as they struggle for liberation from colonialism and from the Jewish attempt to control big parts of Palestine. On the other side <clears throat> are Israelis. Now again, complicated. The word Israeli refers to the citizens of the state of Israel. And the vast majority of these citizens today are Jews, seven million. But among the citizens, the nine million citizens of the state of Israel are also Palestinians who stayed in their lands after 1948, Muslims and Christians and others who became Israeli citizens. But the state of Israel is very linked to an ideology that was born in the 19th century, Zionism. Zionism very much forged out of a certain religious current in Judaism that placed great emphasis on the biblical texts, but was also influenced by the realization that Jews were made to feel more and more marginal in Europe, more and more discriminated against, violence breaking out at times in the eastern parts of Europe in particular, and then reaching an absolute peak during the Nazi period. Zionism proposed a solution to this Jewish problem. Let us return, and again the word return, based upon biblical sources, but very, very problematic. Return to the land of our forefathers and there create a state that will open its doors to receive Jews fleeing persecution and hostility. Let us remember, though, that even until today, the majority of Jews do not live in the state of Israel. And more and more Jews are uneasy 
with what is happening in Israel-Palestine because of the ongoing war. But many Jews and Palestinians are very affected by the trauma of history. From the Jewish side, the memories, and of course learning constantly about the Shoah, the attempt of the Nazis to wipe out Jews. And on the Palestinian side, the memory, the traumatic memory of being driven out of the land of their ancestors in 1948 and not being allowed to return. Interestingly, although we could fall into dichotomic thinking that here are Jews and Arabs, Palestinians and Israelis, there are groups that are more complex, and I just want to mention them so that we don't think that this very short presentation covers everything there is to say. Let us remember again that among the Israelis, there are Palestinian Arabs, citizens of the state of Israel. There are problems, of course, because the state is defined as Jewish, and so there are problems of discrimination. But nonetheless, these Palestinian Arabs have citizenship and participate in the life of the state of, Arab, of, of Israel. <laughs> On the other hand, there are Jews not only from Europe, especially after 1948. Hundreds of thousands of Jews came to Israel from the surrounding Arab countries. I've referred to them here a little provocatively as Jewish Arabs, for their language at least in history, when they arrived in the country between 1948 and 1958, was Arabic. And they had been part and parcel of a wider Arab world. I think particularly of Jews from Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, Libya, Egypt, Yemen, Lebanon, Syria, Iraq. Jews who had been speaking Arabic, living in the Arab world, participating in Muslim civilization for centuries. When will the war end? So, I think for me and many like me, we want the war to stop. We want the war to stop now. Too much death, too much bloodshed, too much destruction. But what kind of peace process can be engaged in today? The international community, based upon the United Nations decision of 1947, still speaks of two states. One Israeli state in the borders that were recognized in 1949, and a Palestinian state made up of the Gaza Strip and the West Bank. Yes, this is still a possibility, perhaps, but what needs to be taken into account is that Israel has built huge Jewish towns and villages all through the West Bank. Although they pulled out of the Gaza Strip, the West Bank is still heavily colonized. Interestingly, the very biblical places that religious Jews feel attached to, places like Hebron and Nablus, Shechem, are actually in the Palestinian occupied territories. And so, Many, many Israeli Jews feel deeply connected to the, the biblical sites in the West Bank and particularly to East Jerusalem. So then, can we say that maybe one day, and again it's very utopic, <clears throat> one day there will be one state, one state for all those who live in this land, at the present time, there are 14 million people living between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea in the land we are referring to as the Holy Land that can be called Israel-Palestine. Half of them are Jews and half of them are Palestinians. Could we imagine a solution of justice, a solution of peace, where each person is respected in their own identity? as an equal citizen, free to live in the land. Again, it's not enough to say justice and peace 
for all peoples in the Holy Land. That justice and peace must be constructed on equality and freedom. Finally, because I am aware that I'm talking to an audience where many might be Christian, I do want to perhaps very briefly address what is the role of the church. I want to first talk about the illustrations that you see there that are not immediately understood. These are illustrations of Christians who have died in the last four months of war in Gaza. Yes, there is a Christian community in Gaza, and it is a Christian community that has suffered terribly from the bombardments and the shooting of Palestinians by the Israeli army. Ilham Farah, who is receiving communion in the picture, was shot by a sniper, an 85-year-old woman left to die in the street. Nehida and Samar Antun were shot in the courtyard of the Roman Catholic Church as they tried to go to the bathroom. And near to the beginning of the war, in the Orthodox Church, a wall, a wall of the ancient St. Porphyr's Church elapsed, killing 18 people, 17 of whom were Christians of the tiny Christian community in Gaza. What role for the Church in this land of suffering? And I would immediately suggest we as Church, we must take on a prophet prophetic role. A prophetic role means speaking truth to power. And the truth is derived not only from revelation, not only from the values that we preach, but from knowing the past. As you can see, I've tried to give very briefly some kind of historical context. It's only when we know the past that we can deal with the present. And then reading carefully the present. Reading carefully the present so that we can hear all the voices. The church is a very small group. Christians in Palestine are 1% of the population. Christians in Israel are 2% of the population. We are too small a group to play power politics. And I think that being a small group frees us up to be at the margins and look on and read carefully and analyze precisely our present. But not only that, the future that we would like to see, a future of equality and freedom, we must make that real. And here the church is strong, for we have institutions that were founded by our forefathers who came to the country, especially in the 19th and first part of the 20th century. We have schools, hospitals, universities, where that future can be made real by putting into practice our own insistence on equality and on freedom. In our schools, in our universities, we have mostly a Muslim majority, and we are at the service of all of our schools and universities. In our hospitals, we also have Jews, and there we can really show what a society would look like where there is equality and freedom. Of course, yes, we have the word. And the word, for us being Jesus, teaches us how to communicate in a world of such incredible violence. Our words must be chosen carefully so that they speak to the needs of a people dreaming of a better future. In the church, and this of course helps when we want to be a prophetic margin, there are, is a majority of Christian Palestinians, Arabic speaking, whether they are citizens of Israel, living in Gaza or living in the West Bank. But there is also a small community of Hebrew speaking Christians, part and parcel of Israeli society. And so I'm going to end this very brief presentation, hopefully making sense to an audience so far away and in a different time zone, I'd like to end with a song. It's a song from a number of years ago. 
a an Israeli singer and a Palestinian singer, citizen of Israel, Ahinoam Nini and Mira Awad. But it's the words that speak directly to my heart, and I hope they will speak to your heart too. Thank you so much for those words, Father Neuhaus. It's such an important message, so so moving, so, such a serious issue. And at this point, we want to hear from our audience. And there is uh, two ways you can ask a question to Father Neuhaus. You can raise your hand if you want to be unmuted and then you can um, put something in the chat and I think that we should start with the chats Katie if you wouldn't mind sharing because there's a couple of questions we've already received and let me assure you when you chat you may not see all the chats but we see them and as time allows we will share the, and ask on your behalf the questions you put in the chat. Uh, so, Katie, would you like to begin? Sure. So, um, yeah, if again, with uh, everybody, uh, you know, uh, nervous about asking questions, we'll ask your questions anonymously from the chat. So, uh, with the option Professor Presby mentioned with raising your hand, you can, you know, be public about who you are asking the question. If you put it in the chat, uh, we can keep it anonymous. And then also if there are kind of multiple questions in the same vein, I'll kind of combine them together so that um, we have time for all the questions. So um, the first one uh, that came up um, was asking uh, Father Neuhaus to explain um, this concept of the promised land. So he, he you talked about it a little bit, but um, they were, the, this question is asking, um, how do we understand this concept of the promised land? Is it more abstract? Is it more um, physical? Um, how do we understand uh, that idea coming from the Bible? So it's a very, very complex question. I've written a book about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that rather than going into the very great complexity of trying to uh, interpret the role of the land in the Bible, I think we must start from the artificiality of applying an ancient text to a modern reality without taking into context modernity and all that we now know about reality. So, of course, the land plays a very, very, very important part in the biblical narrative of a people chosen by God to become a light to the nations. Of course, when you add the New Testament to the old, the role of the land becomes completely transformed as borders vanish. Jesus comes to bring down those borders. So, of course, that means that for Jewish readers of the biblical text and for Christian readers of the biblical text, there's inevitably going to be differences of interpretation. But I go back and say that when these texts get mobilized to legitimize movements of 19th century European nationalism, we must recognize that there is a huge danger of perverting the texts in order to justify modern ideologies. And I think that here is a danger that we see playing out before our eyes. Again, the question is not the Jewish connection to the land. That is something that is age old. But the attempt to um, uh, root the creation of a Jewish state with all the modernity of what a state means and the practices, the ethnocentric practices of that state in a biblical text that goes back 2000 years. So I'd be very cautious before I'd uh, bring out biblical texts in order to justify any aspect of our present conflict. Wonderful. Um, Professor Presby, do you have anyone who wanted to uh, speak? 
Uh, well, so far, there's been no hands raised, but I could read one from the chat because now there's quite a few from the chat. Uh, sure. And, then, and then you could line up your next question from the chat. Sure. There was a question about, is Palestinian suffering on the radar of Israelis? And if not, what, what are the consequences of this? So, of course, again, I'll make a preliminary before I dive into the into the question itself. I think we must be very, very careful of talking about Israelis and Palestinians as though they are monolithic, uniform groups of people who all think the same. But undoubtedly, right now, I think that very few Israelis, because they are so focused on what happened on the 7th of October, so focused on the hostages that were taken and uh, more than a hundred of them still held hostage, so taken with their own suffering. Many had to leave their homes because of the Palestinian violence. Um, many soldiers are in horrible conditions in Gaza fighting this horrible war. They are so focused on their own suffering that Palestinian suffering gets shunted out of view. And I think it is rather terrifying that in the mainstream Israeli press, we hear very little about the horrific, catastrophic circumstances of Palestinians in the Gaza Strip. And so, indeed, this is a very, very great concern to all those who want to say we need an immediate ceasefire to stop this incredible suffering. Thank you. And just uh, with everything that you've been providing, one uh, uh, audience member was asking for a little bit of clarification about a word that they've heard and they didn't fully understand is uh, Christian mm -hmm. Zionism. Yes. So if you could explain that. Yeah, thanks. Okay. So Christian Zionism is another ideological complex that is different from Zionism as practiced by Jews and in fact is much more ancient than Jewish Zionism. Christian Zionism has its roots in uh, 17th century Protestant Christian thinking about the end of times. And of course, one of the burning questions for Christians is, what is the role of the Jews? And so Christian Zionists began to formulate a type of idea whereby, in order for Jesus to return, to come again, as we are all waiting for Jesus' second coming, the Jews need to be restored to their land. Of course, this is not at all Jewish thinking. Uh, this is really coming out of Christian circles. What became very important, beginning already at the end of the 19th century, was when Christian Zionism and Jewish Zionism uh, converged. And this became particularly potent after the 1967 war, where Jews and Christians who were Zionists, both of them Zionists in their own particular way, began more and more to use a language, I think it's a perverse religious language, claiming that God was acting through the victory of the Israelis in 1967 to, uh, to, to bring about his plan. Now, this collaboration between Jewish Zionists and, and Christian Zionists is a kind of strategic collaboration where the Jewish Zionists say, we want your political support, we want your economic support, but please do not talk to us about your dreams of where this is leading. Because, of course, for Christian Zionists, who tend to be very fundamentalist in their understanding of scripture and theology, they think it's leading to Jews through Zionism, recognizing Jesus and becoming Christian. So there is an internal clash there in these Zionisms, but both of them are being used to dispossess Palestinians using the Bible, using religious language in a way that, again, I would insist is rather perverse. Thank you. Um, yeah, and I wanted to go back to what you were saying about uh, Israeli responses, because I see a lot of parallels um, for myself living in the United States with post 9-11 and kind of this, uh, what do you call those uh, things that horses wear? 
uh, where, you know, you couldn't really say anything uh, at that moment because there was just that intent. Yeah, that intensity. Um, uh, Professor Presby, was there someone who wanted to use their voice? Um, yes, I'm going to unmute. Uh, Father Gary Wright, would you like to say something? You could unmute yourself. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. I, uh, I'm a Jesuit here in the uh, Jesuit community at the university. And my question is just, do you have any particular uh, recommendations for us uh, Jesuits in the United States in terms of how we address this war, this conflict uh, in our ministries, you know, our presence in the university here and our parishes and our other schools? Um, as you well know, it's a, it's a highly conflicted situation here in the U.S. as well. And how, how might we most uh, effectively and accurately address this? So I'd say the first thing, not being an American and not being completely familiar with all of your context, I would say the first thing is please address it. Mm. The easiest way is to ignore it and hope it'll go away. But with the extensive involvement of the United States in the conflict, I think it's very, very important that at centers of learning, and particularly centers of learning in the Catholic Church, that the issue itself gets raised. Second, I would look very, very closely at the language that the Church has been using since 1917. Okay, the Church started to develop a vocabulary to talk about Israel-Palestine already in its first reactions to the Balfour Declaration and the mandate for Palestine in 1920. So we have a lot of resources that help us to put the message across and put the message across in terms that respect all the different aspects of the complexity of the land. And what are those aspects? I'll say four. And I think in Whenever we talk about Israel-Palestine, we should be conscious of these four. Number one, that this holy land is not only sacred to Jews and to Muslims, but it's the land where our church was born and where Christians still struggle to keep alive the Mother Church of Jerusalem. So to be very sensitive to the voice of the Mother Church of Jerusalem. Number two, we need to read the Bible carefully so that we can fight against the perversion, manipulation, and ideologization of the texts of the Bible. And thanks be to God, because it's been foisted on us, there is more and more work being done on how to read something like the land in the biblical text. You have in your midst, he's not Catholic, but he's a wonderful exegete, Walter Brueggemann, who as early as the late 1960s wrote a wonderful book on the land that was updated in the 1980s and should be used as a textbook to discuss really the question of the land. Number three, we have a very complex and not always happy relationship with Jews and with Muslims. As Christians, we have a long tradition of anti-Judaism, that developed into anti-Semitism, and we must make sure that nothing in our language ever smacks of anti-Judaism or anti-Semitism. We have a long and not always happy relationship with Muslims. And again, we must make sure that nothing that we say vehicles Islamophobia and stereotypes about Muslims that we know only too well, and as Professor Merriman pointed out, particularly vicious and pernicious after 2002. And the fifth, sorry, and the fourth domain is the domain of justice and peace. As a church, we want to promote values of justice and peace. Those values are meaningless if we do not focus also on questions of equality and liberation, liberty. So I'd say that here, uh, it is very important that we hear the voices of Jesuits, of Jesuit communities, of Jesuit institutions, but really of all people in the United States, really trying to get their mind around a problem in which you are so fully engaged. Okay, Israel remains, I think, per capita, the, the largest recipient of American funding. You are um, 
shipping arms into our part of the world like there's no tomorrow. And I don't think that you want to take responsibility for that. I think that you want to be out there protesting uh, where your government is not looking out for your values and your interests. Thank you very, very much. It's wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you, Gary, for your question, um, or uh, Father Wright. Um, lots of questions coming in. We're, we're definitely working hard to get them heard. Um, so we're going to go to a question about um, the, the one state solution. Um, and uh, you use the language of uh, utopian vision. Um, and I also thought, thought that was interesting considering uh, your background uh, connection to South Africa and, and being born there as well and, and their experience of that, um, you know, and obviously their, their relationship with the International Criminal Court about the genocide happening right now. And so, yeah, the person was asking you, and there's been a couple other questions as well. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> If is what is what does it look like on the ground for um, a one state solution? And then a rel a, a, a related question um, that another person asked is, what does it mean to people if they have a certain idea of Jewishness tied to nationalism if they're moving towards uh, one state solutions? So yeah, a lot of pieces, but I'm trying to just kind of put together all these different questions. Yeah. So I would say that. In Israel, the one-state solution has almost no support at all. That very little marginal support seems to be growing, though, in recent, in recent time. But really, the vast majority of Jews see as absolutely essential to their very being the existence of a Jewish state. Among them would be those who would be willing to have a Palestinian state alongside and that those would be the people who say, yes, equality, but equality between two people, not equality of individuals within one unitary state, but the equality of two peoples, each of them having the right to a national state. And those were principles that were formulated uh, after the First World War. And the whole hope was that in 47, that partition of Palestine would lead to two states. But of course... Uh, Whereas strategically the Jewish side accepted the two states, the Arabs were so shocked that this recent, for them, colonialist presence of Jews was being allowed to take a huge part of their territory. So it was not real then. And since then, it has not been real after the 67 war because of the extensive development of Jewish presence in the lands that were supposed to become the Palestinian state. So when I say one state, the question is really, is there any future to a two-state solution when the populations are now so intermixed in terms of geography that how are you going to carve out a Palestinian state from all the lands that Jew Jewish Israelis control? But beyond that, I speak again as a Christian. It's interesting, I think, that many, many Christians would be almost existentially committed to a one-state solution. Because, of course, their fear is that a Jewish state would continue to be completely ethnocentric, and so Palestinians, including Christians, would be second-class citizens. And a Palestinian state, also partly in reaction to recent history, would be so Islamic that they wouldn't feel at home in it. So at least from Christians, and that's, of course, the milieu in which I live, which I frequent, where we reflect together, that milieu certainly keeps the one-state solution alive. Um, Gail, do you have a, a, a person who'd like to speak? Sure. Um, Donna, would you like to ask your question? Yes, I would. Thank you. Uh, and uh, your comments ha are well taken. I think that what you've shared is a very balanced and fair approach to what we are seeing. I would like to know, though, your thoughts on the genocide that is taking place in, in that area. I know here in the States and also across the world, 
there is so much outcry uh, just from the public against what is going on. I have been somewhat surprised that I have not seen the Catholic Church or institutions affiliated with the Catholic Church who have not lent their voices against the inhumane acts that we're seeing. And I just would like to know your, your thoughts on that. Okay, so Donna, I think that even in your in your speaking, we need to distinguish between three things. There is the the genocide. Genocide means wiping out a people. Yes. And then you say inhumane acts. Well, that doesn't always need to be genocide. That can be absolutely terrible, terrible things like carpet bombing, using types of explosives that one wouldn't use against a civilian population, etc., etc. I would tend at this particular point to focus on, and this was brought up at the, the Hague process, I would uh, uh, bring up genocidal intention. And this was the documentation that South Africa presented of leading Israeli spokespeople, political leaders and military leaders who have genocidal intention, meaning they talk in terms that could facilitate at some point a genocide. I would say that right now we are not facing a genocide. We are facing extreme inhumanity. Okay, extreme inhumanity. But, you know, the, where, when do we tip over into genocide? Well, very often we only know that with hindsight. But I would say that once again, we desperately need an end to this war. And one of the things that was very important in the in the Hague uh, uh, discourse was to stop people using discourse that justifies genocide. Because again, we know this from history, <laughs> words can become policies and policies can become actions and then it's too late. And thank you for that, for that response. So I would just ask for clarification at what, what would you, what is the tipping point then that you're saying that you would qualify the, the horrific acts that we are seeing? the bombing of hospitals, the killing of women and children, bodies left in the street, desecration of cemeteries, cultural, you know, things just destroyed, residential areas bombed. What do you consider genocide then? So this is a very, very difficult thing to, to talk about. Huh? But I would say that... <laughs> While there is an active resistance uh, that Israel can claim to be trying to stamp out, Israel will not look at these actions, and I don't think that your, your government will or other countries take seriously this, uh, this accusation of genocide. Again, I think we need to stamp out the discourse around genocide and try to really focus on um, a kind of ethics of military confrontation where civilians are taken care of. And here is where the inhumanity of the present practices is absolutely manifest. Okay, again, the Israelis will claim each time that what is happening is they are fighting against armed forces and not focusing on civilians. When the civilian death toll is released, they say, well, these are people caught in the middle, collateral damage. And again, uh, I don't know at which point we're going to say, because that we'll know from hindsight, no, this in fact was a plan, a, a tactic to wipe out the Palestinian people. But I would say, Donna, that this again, did it start on the 23rd of October? Okay, again, discourse has been absolutely violent and hateful for decades when it comes to certain parts of the Zionist dealing with Palestinians. And so I think that now, rather than getting engaged in kind of uh, uh, semantics, is this genocide, isn't it genocide, we need to get all our forces together to put a stop 
to the violence so that so that death uh, does not reign in those areas. Thank you. I'm sure there could be much more said on this, and maybe we'll get more questions. But let's uh, hear from some others. Uh, Katie, did you want? Sure. To... Yeah. Um, so, um, so uh, sorry, <laughs> I was I was like in the middle of uh, processing. Um, so I think that. Um, um, Sorry, this is a difficult subject. Um, no, and, yeah, it's a, and you know, because for my mind, uh, you know, the, I think uh, it's it's difficult with the, the talking about the practicality of terms uh, and kind of the strategic uh, employment of language versus you know knowing you know uh, see, seeing what you're witness witnessing as genocide as ethnocide, um, you know, intentional work, um, over, over decades, um, with, with the powers that be. Um, so I wanted and to, actually, uh, oh, pardon, pardon me, go ahead. Well, I could add just since you're mentioning that problem, it, we could even say maybe some agreement about the term genocide could then help end the war faster. But I, if you're saying it'll be too hard to get agreement on the word, and in the meantime, it's faster to just end the war before settling the issue of genocide. I, I can see that as the other side. But I'm sure that those who want to clearly decide whether it's genocide are doing it because they want a quick end to the war. Mm. Uh, uh, but let's turn to some of our questions. Because yeah, so, there are so many questions. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so I, I found one question very interesting um, where that's that's more existential. Um, and I think it would be helpful to hear from someone who is living um, through um, this this in Jerusalem about dealing with existential dread uh, and just this feeling that um, of being, you know, frozen that that there that, that at the end there is nothing uh we can do and so i i wanted to i know you already talked about uh the ways in which the u.s government is involved with this arms companies in the u.s is involved with this but i wanted to ask maybe if you want to speak from the religious perspective or not specifically from the religious perspective but how do people deal with those real psychological um barriers to kind of feeling like something can be done so again, a huge topic. I think that one of the very, very uh, real realities is the reality of fear. Okay, and the fear that is played with by political leadership in order to get people to become more and more intransigent. I'm thinking, you know, particularly on the Israeli side, uh, this whole dwelling on what happened on the 7th of October, which was absolutely catastrophic and shocking. But of course, the way that it is being read and reread is to make sure that we have as many Israelis as possible supporting what is going on in the war, not allowing any discussion of the issues of crimes against humanity, or if you want, uh, a genocide. So I think that here I am so grateful for being a believing person, for having somebody to turn to. And I would say that that somebody even brings me, as I go up searching for the parent God, brings me down back to earth to look at those that I'm fighting against as my brothers and sisters, because they are also looking up to the parent God. And I have noticed Again, it's not an empirical study. But I've noticed that some of the people that I found most uh, consoling to speak to in these times where there's no consolation are other believers. Whether they are religious Jews or religious Muslims, somehow the reference to God takes us out of this incredible existential crisis which is encapsulated in fear and hatred and desire for revenge and inhumanity. 
uh, that somehow by turning to to the divine uh, there is a way to get out of uh, this this terrible terrible loneliness of being caught in your own fear and your own need for constant self defense so i mean that's that's what i can say i love the words of pope francis when in 2014 he brought uh, Shimon Peres, the president of Israel, and Mahmoud Abbas, the, the president of the Palestinian Authority. He brought them together in the Vatican gard Gardens. And he said, uh, as an act of supreme responsibility, not as an escape from reality, but an act of supreme responsibility, we turn our eyes heavenward to acknowledge the father or the mother who looks down on his or her children. And we can recognize through that upward gaze and then outward gaze, the other as a brother or a sister. So I think that, you know, I'm really more aware than ever that uh, having faith in this situation is, is uh, very, very essential to my sanity. And I think to the sanity of some of those that I'm meeting. Wonderful. I think, uh, Professor Presby, yeah, you had someone. Yes, uh, Sue, would you like to ask a question? Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, Father Neuhaus. Um, I have read that um, after World War II, when Britain was looking for a place for the Jews in Europe after the Holocaust, they looked to Central Africa, uh, specifically Uganda. And I, I worked in South Africa a very long time. And I, when I heard this a number of years ago, I thought, how did they ever imagine that European Jews would want to settle in what is now Uganda? Do you know about this? Yes, yes, this is a well-known plan, but it's not from the days of World War II. It's from the beginning of the 20th century. It goes back to the years 1903, 1904. And again, I think it does help to say a few words about this idea that Jews who were then not suffering in Germany, but were suffering in Imperial Russia uh, in waves of pogroms, could be assisted by having a homeland in Uganda. Now, of course, for traditional Jews, that was unthinkable. But for people like the founder of political Zionism, Theodor Herzl, the idea seemed to be a useful one. But rather than looking into why he thought it was useful or not, I do want to point out that I think today we would all be perfectly aware that moving a group of foreigners, however badly they've been treated in the countries in which they live, to a land that is not really their own, where there is an indigenous population, is part and parcel of a world that we don't anymore recognize as our own. This is colonialism. This is an empire taking possession of a land and then using it for whatever it feels it might serve the empire. And Palestinians see that as what happened when Jewish migration came into Palestine. Now, of course, what makes it a little different in the, in the Palestine case is that in Jew, Jews did in, indeed arrive from Europe. And very few of them had an interest in really integrating into the existing society, culture, language, civilization. They came as Europeans who were quite convinced that they were superior. But at the same time, they didn't have a motherland to go back to. And this is, of course, what created uh, a very specific circumstance when one talks about Israeli Jews. The South African parallel is to some degree workable because when white people uh, ruled black people, they might have been seen as foreigners, but they insisted that they were white Africans. And, of course, the vision of Nelson Mandela of the Rainbow Nation meant that, really, equality for everyone was essential to the solution so that blacks and whites could live together. I think that we do here in, in Israel-Palestine have something to learn from the South African situation 
we still have a very, very long way to go in order to implement that type of equality. But Uganda was just a passing phase because, in fact, when Herzl introduced the idea of Uganda to the Zionist Congress, it was booed down by Jews who said, we will not forego the land of our ancestors, which is Palestine. And in fact, uh, Herzl uh, felt that he had been betrayed. Now, it's not sure that he thought of Uganda as a permanent solution, but he felt betrayed that people turned against him. Uh, and those were the years 1903, 1904. He died at the age of 44 in the midst of that crisis. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, going back to the chat, um, I wanted to uh, bring in a concern that is uh, specific to our context in the U.S., but I've also seen in um, Germany and some other sites, and that has to do with being able to talk honestly um, about uh, the war, but then um, the label uh, being used of anti-Semitism. So the difficulty when we take anti-Semitism very seriously in the U.S., also because of our own complicity um, with uh, the genocide in Europe, um, as well as people's personal connections to that. And then the difficulty here in the United States and Germany and other places of being able to talk openly and that being kind of a conversation stopper because of its implications. So uh, several people were asking for guidance on that. Again, I think that firstly, uh, we need to be very careful in the way we speak. We need to choose our words very carefully. I'll give an example. When we talk about the war in Gaza, some people will say the Jews, the Jews, the Jews. I'd already say there there's a problem. Uh, say the Israeli government, say the Israeli army, okay? But don't bandy around the word Jews. The same goes, by the way, everything that I say, the same goes for Muslims and and uh, it's, uh, it's absolutely parallel in our very troubled history with how we've interrelated with Jews and, and Muslims, our meaning our Christian uh, attitudes. The second thing is to recognize that there is indeed a problem and we need to be courageous. Okay, we mustn't be cowed. You know, if we do use the right vocabulary and we condemn the genocidal intentions of certain Israeli government and army leaders, if someone says to us that's anti-Semitism, we need to stand up and say, absolutely not, absolutely not. A third thing is to recognize that when this debate is taking place in a country like the United States of America, there's so much else going on uh, when the Jewish community stands up to defend Israel. What has been fascinating, of course, in this recent from four months, is the numbers, not small numbers, of Jews saying, not in our name. Don't do this in our name. And so I think it is important to look out for a Jewish community, look out for a Muslim community, and in dialogue with them, develop a sensitivity to how Jews might indeed feel threatened. But that doesn't mean to cower to the Jewish threatenedness and to be aware that there are enough our political leaders among Zionists today who will use anti-Semitism to silence any criticism. By the way, even coming from other Jews. They'll call them self-hating Jews and accuse them of being anti-Semites as well. So again, it's a very complex issue. I think that the first step means getting our language right, speaking the right kind of language so that what we're saying is what we mean and we can be heard in the context in which we live. Thank you. Um, I think Professor Presby has another voice. Yes, Prasad, if you could ask your question. Thank you, uh, Gail and Katie. Uh, Father Neuhaus, thank you very much for this presentation. Um, truly remarkable. I. I feel a great hope in the words that you use. I will say that my vantage point is as a Palestinian, pro-Palestinian activist for the last 30 years, but I am a peace activist who, who really seeks peace in that region along the lines as you have outlined. My question is particularly from your vantage point, 
as a South African about the use of boycott, divestment, and sanctions against the state of Israel um, as a tool to bring about change and to end the occupation. And in particular, whether Jesuit universities such as ours, who have been remarkably silent to my great uh, distress, um, should divest from any of their relationships, not only with the state of Israel, but also with our own defense department, um, which in, in light of the billions of dollars that we send to the state of Israel for military aid. So being a South African and being convinced that the BDS had a very, very important role in bringing apartheid to an end, I do believe that BDS is one form of nonviolent uh, uh, opposition to occupation and discrimination that can bring the state of Israel to realize that occupation and discrimination are not in the interests of the state of Israel. Again, it's, it's very sensitive. <laughs> and it needs to be done with great intelligence and, if possible, in dialogue uh, with Israelis who want change, who want an end to occupation and discrimination. So that I'd say that some kind of very blanket, anything to do with Israel, we wipe off the map, is not the kind of BDS that I would think of. And that's not the type of BDS that was being proposed against South Africa. It was a real analytical approach to where can we influence uh, the Israeli economy, Israeli society, Israeli culture, to give up uh, this attachment to the domination of another people and move towards equality and liberty. Thank you. And I just want to say, these days I listen a lot back to one of my favorite singers, Johnny Clegg, um, whose who's, who's songs, even during the height of apartheid in South Africa, brought a message of hope. Yes. Um, and I still listen to it as something that I think brings a message of hope, even in it, the Israeli-Palestinian context. So thank yes. you. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, so I just want to bring everybody's attention. We're a little less than um, 10 minutes to the end of the talk. So if you do have any questions, please be sure um, to put them in the chat or to uh, write directly to Professor Presby. Um, so we're going to take a step back uh, just from our moment or perhaps connect it back because of um, your points about um, uh, knowing history well in order to uh, truly, truly um, speak justice to power. Um, so there were a couple questions about the past uh, in relationship to the Ottoman Empire. Uh, the role that it played in these developments, as well as, and this is a little bit later, um, uh, someone asking why Jewish populations um, left uh, the countries where they lived in the Arabic speaking world, in North Africa and the Levant and Iraq, et cetera. So, yeah, a lot of people, I think, uh, you know, it's very fuzzy for them uh, with these uh, additional actors. So, yeah. So much, please. I'm not in that sure how to make that less fuzzy. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, well, actually, the Ottoman one, one Empire. I want to say, oh, sorry. One, one thing that I do want to connect. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no, continue. Please, Oh, yeah. So because because to connect it to today, like, you know, why ask these questions as well is a lot of times because people create this idea of since the dawn of time, these religions, you know, blah, 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 don't right. work together. Right. And then thinking about um, today when we have actors such as the, U, uh, the United Arab Emirates or Saudi Arabia, their relationships with the government of Israel. And so a lot of times if people only have this oversimplified idea of religious conflict, um, it, it makes things not make sense. So yeah, that's why I think these historical questions are so important and useful. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so I'd say first of all that because history is interesting, I think that one thing that comes out of studying closely history is to recognize that religion plays a role, but it's not the major source of the conflict. Religion is mobilized into conflicts that have to do with national identity, with resources, with the desire to control and then leading to the domination of other peoples, uh, it's not the religion itself that is provoking these crises, at least not the one that's going on in Israel-Palestine now. Again, Israel is a very important 
legitimation, justification of what's going on. But it's not the reason that this is going on. So I think that that's very important to underline. Now, a word about, and this shows that religion is not really the, the, at, the, at the heart. One of the things that provoked Palestinian fury, outrage, and despair was what the United States vehicled during the time of the Trump administration as the Abraham Accords, which I think that you are hinting at when you say, wow, there are diplomatic relations between Israel and the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain, and if you go back even further, Jordan, Egypt, and just before the 7th of October, it was as if we're going to wake up tomorrow and the Saudi crown prince is going to be visiting Tel Aviv. I'm sorry to say, but this was part of a terrible lie that peace was coming. It had nothing to do with peace. It had to do with new alliances being built against Iran. And I don't want to even get into the Iranian question, but Israel's alliances with United Arab Emirates and Bahrain and Saudi Arabia and Morocco and Egypt and, and Jordan have more to do with American interests in opposing the Iranian influence in the Middle East, then they'd have to do with peace. But where was it so frustrating for Palestinians? The real underlying agreement was, we're finished with Palestinians. They're a footnote in a history book that has no relevance anymore. We've contained the Palestinian issue. And so, except in words, United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, and even to a large extent, Egypt and Morocco, they were no longer really pushing for a just solution to the Palestinian problem. And so again, what we have at work here are economic, political interests, much more than some kind of religious uh, war. Again, religion can be manipulated in any which way you want. I think that for those of us who are religious and who have faith, I think that we really do believe uh, that religion can play a positive role. And I think that we must really work against the, the, the instrumentalization of religious traditions to promote violence and warfare. Thank you. Uh, Gail, as our host, uh, I, I want to give you the last question uh, slot if if you okay. have a question. <laughs> um, we had a, a question from one of our Sisters of Mercy. Great. And she's been uh, following you, Father Neuhaus, your America Magazine article, and someone who wrote what she's calling a rebuttal, Dr. Karma ben Yohannan, who said, the Jewish fate today is tied to the fate of Israel. Uh, regardless of someone's uh, political inclinations. And uh, the sister would be interested in your take on that claim or anything else you have to say about her article. So Karma ben Yohanan, who is a professor at Hebrew University, who has written a very, very interesting book about Jewish-Catholic relations, recently translated into English, was at the core of a group of Jewish people from all over the world who directed a letter to Pope Francis expressing their deep discomfort at the way that Pope Francis, in their opinion, had not expressed sensitivity for Jewish suffering since the 7th of October. I'm happy to say that on the 2nd of February, Pope Francis answered that letter. Pope Francis sent a letter, a personal letter, to Karma ben Yohanan, it's not a private letter because the text was published, but it was sent to her to share with the other Jews. And I think that the Pope is laying out a new way for us Catholics to engage with our Jewish brothers and sisters, which means we must listen carefully to what they say and take it very seriously. But we do not have to say amen and hallelujah to every paragraph and every item on the list. And I think, and this is absolutely obvious, but we need to speak about it, within the structure of the friendship that since 1965 have bound us together, our Jews and Catholics together, that for 
a Catholic, the state of Israel is a political reality, which can be a positive political reality if it ensures equality and liberty, justice and peace. But it's not a positive political reality if it means occupation and discrimination. And I think that, again, we cannot be accused of being anti-Semite. And Karma does not say that I'm an anti-Semite. She says that I don't have a lot of empathy uh, for this Jewish state. And I think that she's probably right. I don't have enough empathy. An empathy that poured out on the 7th of October, the 8th of October, the 9th of October. But when we get into January, okay, and we are seeing this incredible unproportional reaction under the title of self-defense, okay, then I think, yes, my empathy wears very thin because I am not only in empathy with the Jewish people. I'm in deep, profound empathy with the Palestinian people that has been living an ongoing catastrophe since 1948. And so here again, I think that the letter of the Pope to, to Professor Ben Yochanan, and by the way, a little insight for all of you, secret, the letter, the response of Karma and her colleagues was sent today to the Pope. And I think it restores a kind of dialogue that is respectful and recognizing that in that friendship there's place for difference. And at times we have to protest, as the Pope has done repeatedly since the second day of the war when he said, War is defeat for everyone. And I think that message for me is clarion clear. Thank you so much for and ending our discussion together on that clarion clear message. We thank you so much uh, for being with us. Thank you to everyone who joined us. Thank you for your questions. And if we didn't convey your question, very sorry about that. Uh, but we've had a lot of time to learn so much from you, uh, Father Neuhaus. And uh, please, any of you, stay tuned to the CLASA website if and when the recording may be available. We will communicate with you. We have your emails through the Zoom registration. So, um, and please check the CLASA website for any other upcoming events of ours, udmercy.edu slash C-L-A-S-A. Thank you again to our co-sponsors, uh, Department of Religious Studies, Office of Mission Integration, Catholic Studies Program. Uh, Thank you, Islamic Studies Program. Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you, Katie, for co-hosting with me. Again, thank you, Father Neuhaus, for staying up so late yes. and talking to us with a lot of gusto, despite any uh, any uh, uh, cold you may have had. We heard you loud and clear. Thank you so thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you for your patience. You. And good thank night, you. everybody. Yeah, good night.